guess I'm just beginning. Thank you all for sh beep, beep. Here we go. Thank you all for showing up today on this very sunny day. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Westport Library and VersoFest. Fabulosity. Um, I am so thrilled to be with this wonderful panel to talk about the evolution of rock style, female rock style. Um, so, okay, I'm going to just do a makeshift introduction, and it's probably going to be marginally fawning, so I'm just warning you. There might be a little fawnage going on. Um, so this is Christian Joy. She has been profiled by the New York Times twice, not by me. Uh, I write for the Times, but I didn't do it those places, um, and other places too I write for. Anyway, um, she is an amazing um, designer of clothing. Um, many people know her uh, clothing stage wear and otherwise for Karen O from the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. She designs clothing for lots of other people and costumes and sells some fabulous clothing online too, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, to at the other end of the table, we have uh, Matthew Yokobowski. Did I pronounce that right? Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. He is the curator. This is not his official title. I'm just going to explain it. He is the curator at the Brooklyn Museum that does all the groovy fashion and music-y shows, um, all of which have blown me away. Um, I, I feel like in the context of this panel, I should point out that there's A, a Thierry Mugler show that's on, and even though it's not rock style, it's kind of rock style, and that's like till May or something, right? May 7th, okay. But, and, and he is the person who did the Studio 54 show and also translated the Bowie show that had been so brilliant in, any, in every other place, London, Toronto, et cetera, to make it a New York, East Coast relevant here show. So that's Matthew. Um, this is the wonderful Vivian Goldman. Um, I would say if you weren't sitting next to me, because it might make you blush, one of the most important female rock critics there ha are, is, have been. Um, one of the first people to write about punk rock, one of the first people to write about, in, the, in England, to write about reggae. She is a professor at NYU and teaches about the very, very important things like punk rock and Bowie. And she's the author of like how many books? Okay, she's going to whip out her book, and she also um, has a, is a recording artiste in her own right. Um, so that's Vivian, right? I'm afraid I only have the Italian edition at the house. Well, yes, um, and uh, and I'm Rachel Felder, and I am a journalist and author, and I write for places uh, including my work's been in like the Times and Rolling Stone, and a lot of New Yorker, a lot of other places, and I write books as well about very important things like red lipstick, and and I should say I worked at a record company for a decade, so I hope. Hopefully, the, mu the music thing is in my soul. Let's, let's put it like that. Um, okay, so we are talking about rock style from Marianne Faithful to Debbie Harry to Lizzo. So first of all, um, I'm going to start with you. Tell me what you think is noteworthy about each of these three women's style. Um, you know, it's funny. I had to look up Marianne Faithful. <laughs> really? <laughs> because I knew Marianne Faithful, I think, more as a, um, you know, as a middle-aged and older woman, you know, and so I kind of like... I didn't, you know, I didn't actually, and I know who she is, you know, but, but I was like, oh, I didn't know she did a big check. <laughs> like, I kind of just knew her as like this, like, um, you know, older kind of cool, you know, smoking sort of bangs, you know, woman. So that was kind of what I actually knew about her was the, the little older version of her. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, I always really admired, you know, her, just her look and everything. But um, Debbie Harry, um, yeah, I mean, I think she's just, you know, she always looks very effortless and cool and, you know, um, I mean, she's just like a smoking hot babe, <laughs> you know, well, so it's well, like... That's it. I mean, you know, I feel like, okay, I, I don't mean to cut ahead and not have you guys answer this question, but, you know, when you think of Marianne Faithful from the early years and you think of Debbie Harry, these were beautiful women. Yeah. And kind of wearing what they could afford yeah. as opposed to, you yeah. know, um, so, and Lizzo? Um, I love seeing Lizzo, you know, like, I love her outfits. I think, you know, she's just totally going for it. And, you know, I just think she always looks very cool and, you know, confident. And, you know, I just, yeah, I think she looks great. Mm. So, yeah. Do you think her look is a punk look, Lizzo? Well, I think she's quite quintessentially punk. Um, 
but I must say, you know, think, thinking about what we've just been saying, right. you know, and I remember Marianne Faithful. She's a bit older than me, but I was a Londoner when Mary. I was like starting high school when she was already being incredibly groovy. But she was at that time projected kind of somewhere, but you know, very virginal with that sort of Laura Ashley vibe of the time. And then Debbie Harry comes along and she does that work with, what's his name again, the designer? Oh, with Stephen Sprouse. Stephen right. Sprouse. So that is one of the first mega rock design collaborations. And he created that quintessentially American, very fluid line, didn't yes. he? With draping right. jersey and the incredible prints on them. And then I think, you know, I'm, they call me the professor of punk at NYU and I did really come up with punk, which is how I know Debbie and the talking heads and that. But to me, it's since then, what is the rock star style? And a lot of it has been about cognitive dissonance. Mm. What is the unexpected? Certainly with punk, that's what it's all about. And somebody like Lily Allen, she really championed it because she was wearing those Chanel ball gowns with the bother boots. And if there's one thing that is a consistent hallmark of women's style in rock, literally one thing, as opposed to Gucci, I would say it's Doc Martens. Anybody with me for Doc Martens? <laughs> yes. You know, so anyway, the evolving style of rock women, I would say that in a sense, when we start out in Marianne Faithful time, and we, we have to say a word here for Anita Pallenberg. Oh, yes. Mega rock chick, you know. Um, is the, actually one of my favorite writers since we're in a library, Ellen Hildebrand. Anybody like her out here? Yeah. <laughs> she puts it so well as a dominion of blondes. That's the line she often uses for, you know, and so what, we're what we've been seeing is a shift very slowly over the decades away from the quintessential, basically Aryan look that was all that was allowed in fashion. Am I right? Mm, sure. And now we are finally getting to a more inclusionary look. So obviously also the blurring of the gender lines has always been a feature. And that's enough of me. Right. Time for Matthew to so, talk. <laughs> so Matthew, what, what are your thoughts about these three women? And, and also why we're still talking about sort of Marianne's early style and, and also Debbie Harry's early style? Hi. Um, well, I really uh, started to learn about Marianne Faithful when she did Broken English, which oh, wow. was around 1980. And then I had to do kind of a deep dive backwards uh, to find out about her earlier work. And I remember at the time Broken English came out, um, they asked Keith Richards what he thought about it. And he said, well, Marianne, she's very good at keeping up with the times. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but she, uh, she had this, uh, you know, very of-the-moment look at that time. Yeah. And it was the same, Broken English came out at the same time as Blondie was starting to become a big pop figure. It's true. And Debbie was wearing um, Stephen Sprouse, mm -hmm. but Stephen Sprouse had worked for Halston in the early 70s. So it's true. he was really coming in, you know, from made-to-measure couture. It wasn't just some random clothes, right. you know? And the patterns that he was making for Debbie, um, he would do things like he would take photographs of a TV screen with the lines on it. Oh, right. And he would put it in a copy machine, and then they would make the patterns on uh, transparent silk. And so when they were layered, it would create these moiré patterns. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it was, you know, punk, but it was couture punk. Yes, exactly. You know? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, Vivian was, was saying that, you know, Doc Martens are rock, are rockness, are punkness. Are there other things that make the style of these women uh, rock style as opposed to just style? I, I always I, think it has a lot to do with the hair and makeup. Yeah. You know, because you, you know, you have Debbie, she's in a dress, you know, but she's got half bleached hair. It's, right. it's not whole, it's not all done, you know, or you have uh, Susie Sue, 
and she's got lots of hairspray going on. Yep. You know, but also lipstick. You know, I'm sure you wrote about it when you did Red, li red Lipstick Oh, yes, book. there's a big picture yes. of the book and a thing about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the lipstick because we're talking about rock style. Lipstick is part of it. And there's actually a picture of Debbie in my book, too. Um, I, I do think that the style is a function. Black lipstick. Oh, yes. But, but um, it's a function of the times, the style, including the makeup. And when I think of Marianne Faithful from As Tears Go By era, as opposed to Broken English era, I can't stop thinking of that look, of that schoolgirl look. There's something about Actually, to the tuxedo, like Yves Saint Laurent. Yves Saint Laurent. Exactly. Yes. But, exactly. But there's a certain kind of like... Um, um, demureness to those first few years of what she wore that I feel like we're in sync with the music. Do you feel that you do you feel that you can like separate the musical sound from the look? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think you know it goes. You know, they kind of have to go hand in hand. You know, you have you you think about the performer and how they're performing. You know, on stage. So it's like when I started working with Karen, she would just she was just insane on stage you know falling all over the place and and I remember one time she came up and said hey can you make me a dress like Bjork and I said no <laughs> because you'll fall on it and you'll hurt yourself you know so I think it's like so I think it is that thing of like you know that that energy you have to follow their energy if you're at least if you're making something for them you know so so but but then at the same time I see a lot of people where I'm like it just looks like they're wearing an outfit you know what I'm saying they don't really look like it's, it's really going with their whole persona, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, and I, it's like, you know, you think of someone like Gwen Stefani, you know, the way she looked like, you know, especially with No Doubt and stuff, it's like she had such a specific look and so many kids wanted to copy it and, and it really went with the sound of the music, I thought as well. So it's like, you know, um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's super important, you know, because it gives, it also gives fans something to follow. And I think that's so exciting, you know, is that they can have the music, but then they can also have the style, you know. Right. I, I, you know, I think that's the good point. It's like, how do you visualize the music? You know, how are you going to create a look that matches the sound that you're creating? And it, as you were talking, it reminded me of um, the story about um, when Tina Turner was going solo and she was doing What's Love Got To Do With It, even though she had been a rock singer, you know, all through the 60s into the early 70s, she said that they were trying to figure out a way for her to look like a new Tina, like yeah. Tina had to create a, a second look, you know, and she said, I had always worn my hair down, mm -hmm. But I, she said it was the 80s, and I thought, well, I'm going to do it up, you know? <laughs> and that's when she put the clips in, and she could do kind of a faux mohawk almost. That's you amazing. Know? Yeah. Um, I, know, I know Debbie Harry is American punk, which is quite a different thing than British punk, but maybe, maybe because you were living there then and living in that world, maybe you could speak a little bit about um, how those artists thought about what they were going to wear, because that those punk looks we think of still, because they were so strong. Well, what's so thanks, Matthew. What's so funny is that um, you know, in the debates around punk, people are always banging on about how oh, it's been commodified, so it's lost its force. And I've got to be honest, I was able to buy this suit in Jackson Heights for very little money, you know. Um, but at the time, you know, we really did have to scrabble it, scrabble it together, <coughs> sorry, from different sources. And it was very exciting and fun, to be honest. There's a great, actually, one of the only photos of me uh, journalisting is me and Susie. And I'm wearing what I would say is the first pair of leopard skin trousers in London. Because I got them in a thrift shop in LA. Okay. You know, um, but it, 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 there was a thrill to it, you know, the thrill of the chase. And again, it was often this mismatching thing that was very key to it, you know, like wearing something, you know, pretty with a tartan thing, just that dissonance. And. Um, I personally don't think that the commodification and the accessibility to those sort of things, you know, that sort of style, 
really makes me love it less. I'm quite glad to be able to go and buy something I like in a shop instead of fighting the old ladies, as it were, in a, in a jumble sale, which is what one did. You know, um, but in a way, I think the big question for the panel and for us in the audience, which I discussed with my friend Don Letts, who is an early punk DJ and all and that. has like one of the best radio shows on a Sunday yeah. night online. It's 5 p.m., um, BBC Radio 6. It's like amazing. So yeah, like me and Don, when we get together, we're always saying, well, what's next? What's next? Because this is just a riff on the sort of, you know, what we were trying to wear then, the tartan with the bother boot, all the mixing up. So, and then we've got the space motif. That's another motif. Space animals, that's a motif. But, but didn't you, weren't you roommates with Chrissy Hind? Yeah. Yeah, from The Pretenders. Yeah. I mean, Chrissy Hind was working at... At West sex, West yes, she yeah. was. Three yeah. pretenders, you know? yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. He knows my whole life. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, and I've only just but, met him. But, yeah. But, but, you know, you were you were at that very, you know, beginning moment, the embryonic stage of yeah, punk. Yeah, you know, yeah, you were seeing yeah. it firsthand. That's really true. And I've got yeah. to say, it was really fun to scrabble it together. But also, the climate that produced that is not that dissimilar to what is happening now, especially in the UK. Strikes, everything seemingly that everybody relied on all these years falling apart and basically the unraveling and basically the end of empire. Mm -hmm. And this is another stage, but one of the first stages did produce punk. So I'm wondering whether the current situation will produce another dynamic quote, youth, quote, movement, which may uh, point us in yet new directions. Well, I yeah. think, I think too, if you think about New York City in the mm. 70s, yeah. you know, we all think about it as being kind of very, well, derelict almost, you mm. know? It was very run down. And there were a lot of new kinds of music happening in New York City. It was very do-it-yourself, you know? Yeah. So punk started out, hip-hop is started out, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this month, um, and disco. Uh, you know, all three of these major music um, genres were percolating, you know, in New York City, and they all had very distinctive looks. looks. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, but you said something, and it's linked to what you guys are saying. You mentioned Gwen Stefani. Yeah. So Gwen Stefani's look is all from a stylist, and, you know, no disrespect to Lizzo at all, because I think, personally, she's um, she represents a certain kind of pride and confidence and lack of, of, of like, an unwillingness to conform in a way that's yeah. beautiful and deeply punk, actually. But, you know, Gwen Stefani works with a stylist. Debbie Harry in 1977 where it wasn't working with a stylist. Chrissy Hine, when she's working, you know, at Vivian Westwood's store, is not working with a stylist. How Except for Vivian. Well, yes, okay, touche, touche, right. But so how do you think the, the role of stylist has changed what we consider as rock style? Actually, we did... Yvonne Gold, I've got to give her props. I don't know whether you know her. She's still around in London. She was probably the original punk stylist. Oh. She did the, she invented the makeup for Zandra Rhodes and Vivian. Wow. If anybody wants to find her, we're still in touch. She's well, in London. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, should do a yeah, piece with yeah, her. Yeah. yeah, so there were stylists because guess who's the stylist in the crew? The one who most enjoys, you know, ferreting around in markets and consignment shops and... Oh, gosh, the fun we used to have. May I just say quickly, one of my most fun accomplishments was when I bought a 1940s, you know those navy crepe dresses with the little white flowers? And just so you know, I cut the top off the bottom, I took in the skirt, and I put that wide elastic webbing at the bottom and made a blouson jacket. But that was the sort of fun we used to have. It was a suit. I didn't have a machine. We no, just sewed it. It was it was safety pins and duct tape exactly. and, and, and even a needle together. and thread. And you're an expert at that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> when I mean, you know, it's like I totally took a cue from the punks, you know, and especially like I we have that picture of uh, the heartbreakers in our mm. living room, the one mm. where they're you know, Richard Hell, and they're all tearing out their oh, hearts yes. out with yeah. the blood, you know, and stuff. And that was like a huge inspiration. And I, I worked for this designer called Daryl Kay, which was in Sixth Street in the sure. East Village. Best trousers ever. Yeah. Yeah. And, <coughs> and I just, and I started to meet, you know, kind of all these people, and I was like, 
wow, all these people just did, did whatever they wanted. You know, they just, they did it themselves. And I hadn't gone to fashion school or anything. And, and I, and I started buying these, and I was so broke. I mean, I lived on like pizza and beer, <laughs> essentially, you know. And and I just remember buying all these prom dresses from the from the Salvation Army, which was like near our house, and just shredding them and 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 ta you know taping them up and doing all these different things. And and that was kind of the way I met Karen O. And then, but when I met her, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. You know, <laughs> so so a lot of her stuff was like stapled together or it was taped together. You know, and it all came from from, you know, punk, you know, where I was like, okay, A, I don't have any money, B, I have no skill, I have no idea how to do this. And then, you know, so it's just sort of like putting something together. And I, But I think there's such an amazing energy that comes out of, you know, when you have to figure things out like that, it's just, you know, it's so explosive and I think it's so exciting. And, and, I, and I started to see like kids doing that again, you know, where they're like remaking clothes and doing things like that. And including my nephew has been doing it and it's like, it's just so, I think it's, there's something so special about that. And it, yeah. it's like um, kind of recreating, you know, things and, and kind of creating something new, you know, out of the old, yeah. which, is, which is something I really love, so, yeah. Absolutely. Can I say just a little something? Sure, of course. You know, I just want to give a little shout out to Pam Hogg. Oh, yes. Isn't yeah. Pam Hogg uh, one of the, you know, deepest rock designers working today mm. and she has you know I was saying there's various tropes in rock fashion right such as animal prints uh, clashing colors neon and so on but out of all the designers working consistently today for the public Pam Hogg and her silver and gold and bright red and black her futuristic mega sexy cat suits uh, I think she's the quintessential, in, uh, you know, in terms of being able to buy, don't mean to dismiss, you know, uh, but quintessential rock designer working today, Pam Hogg, look at her feed and so on. She's been at it forever since the days of punk and she's still defining, I think, a lot of rocks. You should do an expo on Pam, actually. Actually, as it goes, yeah. But I'd be interested as a curator, like I look at, say, the three artists at hand, t hand today, and I, I have so much respect for Lizzo, but there's the element of the stylist and the fact that so much of her clothing feels, to me, designer with a capital D yes. in a different way than other artists and the two other women we're talking about today. So t when, you look at, when you look from a curatorial perspective at you know, rock style in general and artists, how does the involvement of a stylist um, affect how you, you know, your perspective on it? Uh, a lot. Uh, mm. Yeah, um, you know, it's really challenging because the stylist will bring in, you know, um, an example, though it's not punk, but- um, Bring it on, but, it's fine. But, but, but just for basic, but think about Madonna when yeah. she first started out. She was working Maripol. with Maripol. Yep. Maripol was doing all those rubber bracelets. Yep. She was, you know, consulting on the hair, um, and then uh, she worked with Gautier, you know, specifically. Yeah. But then she started bringing bringing in the stylists, you know, Ari, uh, Ariana. Um, Ariana Phillips. Phillips, yep. Phillips yep. yes, and. When Ariana got involved, you know, she was bringing in pieces from 10, 12, 15 different designers, and it was becoming a mix. So you were kind of creating a look, you know, it was Madonna-ish, you know. Um, so, you know, and then you think about somebody like, who's also not punk, but Cher. Right. You know, oh. an allegiance to one designer. Yeah. You know, you, you know what a Cher look is. But when the stylist gets involved and you're thinking curatorially, you know, it's like, you, it, it really becomes about the person really than the designer. Right. You know, so, right. You're, so you, you're thinking about Gwen Stefani then. You're not thinking about like, you know, well, you are thinking about her clothing line, but right, uh, right, lamb. Right, right. Uh, um, but, you know, it's, it's not that dedication the way it was for a long time, you know. Um, it, it, it's, it's splintered. So when you think about exhibition, it becomes, well, well when we did, a, we did a show at the Brooklyn Museum called um, uh, Roots, Rhyme, and Rage, oh, right, which that's was right. about hip-hop nation. Yeah. And 
you had some people like Missy Misdemeanor Elliott who would have one designer do an outfit, you know, mm -hmm. but it's kind of just, it be, it's really about that person who's singing more, more than it is a specific designer, so mm -hmm. it's tricky. It's you tricky. Know. I mean, also. Are you going to do a show about, you know, are you going to do a show about Stevie Nicks? You know, right, it, it right. becomes that kind of a question. Whereas with Bowie, yeah. mm -hmm. Bowie had a personal style. He worked with a lot of different designers over the years, but it was always him, yes. you know, at the core of it. Right, so, absolutely. Yeah. I, was, I was just saying to Matthew before we started, I do teach the Bowie course at NYU Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music. And one thing I do try and impress on the students is once a mod, always a mod. Bowie, in his various looks, always looked sharp, mm. yes. which oh, is the oh, hallmark of a Mark. Uh, well, Mark grew up in the schmatter trade. Well, exactly. You know, like, like I did with my dad, yeah. you know, yeah. That, w that was it. So, and, and Mark in particular, he was an absolute typical of how everybody in those days, like in the East End, had their own tailor. Yeah. And that is what is missing now. Well. I'm afraid today we do have the dominion of leisure wear, which is kind of a sad development. No, Everybody. My, my, favorite, my favorite quote always is from Karl Lagerfeld. He said, I wore sweatpants today, I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. So, exactly. Everybody's unstructured. No, it's true, it's true. Where's the tailoring? Well, um, yeah. So you mentioned earlier about- Luxury fabrics. Well, it's, indeed. It's all about luxury fabrics. Indeed. <laughs> you mentioned earlier about needing to design clothing that Karen O could actually move in on stage, and it strikes me we're talking about rock style, and there's a difference between, um, you know, standing still for a photo shoot versus running around on a stage. So as a designer, how does that, um, when you're making a garment with that in mind, what goes into it and why do you have to think that way? Um, I mean, you ha there's just so much to think about. You know, you're like... Are they going to be hot? Is it going to hold up, you know, for an entire tour? Is it something going to fall off of it? Is the assistant going to cram it into a, <laughs> a like giant, you know, wardrobe case? I mean, there's so much to, to think about. And I think, you know, it's like if we do a photo shoot, I can kind of just like build something on her really quickly. You know what I'm saying? Whereas like, you know, if you have to wear it on stage, it has to last for a long time and, you know, it has to be able to move and like, you know, in the beginning, we started doing um, leotards on her because she moved around so much. And she, and also she was constantly having um, the photographers would shoot up her skirt all the time. So we were kind of like, OK, now we have to do something that's that's going to, you know, not only are, if you fall off the stage, you know, the outfit's going to not kill you, right. but also that, you know, you can move around and pour beer all over it and do all these, you know, different things and, you know, with it. So I think it's just like, you know, it's just more of, you know, how they move and, you know, what, and, you know, using, you know, you have to figure out all the, fa you know, fabrics, obviously, and, and things like that. But, I mean, it's kind of a, you know, it's a challenge. It's kind of a fun challenge to sit there and think, like, how can I build this thing that, you know, she can use over and over again and, you know, it's going to be functional, basically, you know, so it's like, but, but I do also kind of really like doing shoots where it's like, you know, you can just show up with like, you know, a, a giant box, you know, and sort of do something with that, because I think it's so interesting. And, and it's like, you can really create like such a beautiful photo, you know, with, with that. And, you know, I think people think like, you know, it's like, you forget that, you know, um, the piece in the pic, like there's this one photo that I took with some friends of mine, these photographers, Ulex, and it's this really beautiful photo, and it's very graphic, and it's this piece that's like um, supposed to be sort of this nun, you know, but um, the the piece for it is it looks like crap. You know? <laughs> it's like when I when I when I pull it out, I'm like, wow, this is terrible. Like, why did I even make this? You know, and some of it's been thrown away in the trash because it just doesn't stay together. You know, but but I think you, you know you can create something really dynamic. You know, with just just that simple. You know, something that you think like, oh, it's not even good. You know, but then. Um, you know, you look at it, I don't know, in the photograph and it's something totally different. But, and I even think that, you know, on stage that happens because even recently, you know, when the IOs were playing Forest Hills, she came out on stage and I was like, 
had planned for them to have like a certain kind of lighting, you know, and then this video screen came up and I was like, oh, you can't see anything, like, you know, suddenly, but then it's like, but then the photographer steps up and takes this amazing photograph and you're like, oh, I didn't see any, <laughs> you know, but he just happens to be in the, in the right spot. So it's just all of that kind of stuff. But I think like one thing I do always think about is like, okay, who, She's got, she's got to come out on stage because the, you know, the photographers are usually just up front for a certain amount of time. So that first piece that she comes out in has to be super dynamic, you know, and then, and then every, you know, it can still be great after, you know, I want it to be great after that, but I think that's the, the specific idea, you know. Right. I mean, it's interesting to think about how things change once they're on stage on a person who's singing because some of the Debbie Harry shots that I think have been in the background, um, perhaps she's really just wearing a T-shirt and like almost like underpants or the bottom half of a leotard. And because of a certain kind of stance and delivery and overall look, it somehow looks like the grooviest, sexiest costume. Um, Matthew, I know it's not exactly these artists, but I'm interested in this thing about rock fashions for stage, not on stage. So in things like the Bowie show, like um, how do you make them look alive when it's just a flat garment that sort of needs a person in it to become alive? Uh, th thank you. That's <laughs> <laughs> the, the ongoing challenge. Um, you know, uh, with Bowie, um, uh, the, the exhibition was, the clothes were so dynamic on their own and there were often videotapes of him performing in them. So you could have juxtapositions a lot. You right. can actually show how it came to life. Um, right now, as uh, you mentioned, I have the Terry Mugler show up uh, and it has actually two Bowie looks in it, it does. also. Um, it one that he wore with Tin Machine and then a, a dress that he actually wore uh, um, when he did Boys Keep Swinging. Uh. He did three drag looks in it. Um, and w across from that, we have the videos going, but there's other parts of the show where we have looks that he designed for Beyonce's uh, I Am Sasha Fierce tour from 2008, 2009. And we don't have Beyonce right. nearby. And so you're looking for ways to make the mannequin have a bit of movement to them. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of Terry Mugler's great uh, uh, things that he said was, uh, when he looks at the world uh, with the plants and animals and people and undersea creatures, he felt that they all had a vibration to them. And if he used something from the world as inspiration for one of his looks, it was really when the model put it back on that it brought that vibration back to the original idea. Oh, how interesting. So we're always struggling with that, with exhibitions. I you bet. Know. Uh, how, I bet. You, you can't replace the human, you know, uh, dynamism. Yeah. No, exactly. You know, we've mentioned some very key eras in music uh, uh, during a time that there was no social media. So how has social media changed rock fashion and rock style? Well, you know, we, you've mentioned Lizzo a few times now, mm -hmm. who's definitely of this moment uh, in social media. And I was thinking about other performers who were of her silhouette uh, yes. from earlier days. And you think about Mama Cass, yep. Ma Rainey, uh, you think about Deborah Isle from Romeo Void. Yep. Um, and it was challenging for them to, to uh, be stage performers and not be compared. Yes. And Lizzo, her Instagram uh, name is uh, Lizzo Be Eating, you know? <laughs> and she's just very upfront about it from the start. Yeah. You know, she's doing her Yiddy line of uh, um, a clothing line. Um, and she just wants everybody to kind of be very po body positive, you know? This is my shape, you know, this is uh, how I'm going to be, so. Yeah. Well, there but. has been this dominion of, you know, anorexic Aryans, and that has, has been, what do you think? I mean, I'm not making it up, am I? No, you know, I mean. I mean, not right now, it's shifting now, but most of my life. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, th I think the thing is, is that models get, you know, about, I'm going to say it, models get a bad rap a lot for being too thin. But, you know, there are a lot of models who are just naturally that shape, you know, just having worked with a lot over the years, you know. But then there's people like 
Grace Jones, for example, mm. you know, who... Not as Grace Jones. Let's just call her the title she <laughs> I deserves. I call her yeah. the Empress. The exactly. Empress. She was a model. She mm. became a singer. Uh, mm. You think about Sade. Actress. A actress. You know, there are people that began modeling that have those builds, and then, yes. and then they... Uh, are famous, and then people go, oh my gosh, we're glorifying somebody mm. with this shape. Mm. So. Sorry, I didn't mean to attack all thin blondes. I've been a thin blonde myself, <laughs> and some of my best friends are thin blondes. <laughs> the only thing is, when that was the only way that was really respected until fairly recently, and I think that is what we're celebrating here today, is the opening up, you know, of that paradigm. And, you know, for new people with all sorts of different bodies, like Lizzo, you know, and all sorts of different complexions, are at last getting a bit of a look-in in the establishment. I think that's the change we're living through right now. Yeah, I mean, I love that Lizzo, and this is what seems punk about her to me, mm. that um, I guess if you're a certain build, Traditionally, if your mama, I mean, Mama Cass wore moo moos basically, as far as I can remember, right? Yeah. Okay, so Lizzo wears these outfits that have lots of cutouts often, are big, bold colors, are super contoured, and I love, to me, that um, sends out a signal of loving your body and feeling pride, and I feel like we should all feel proud of our dimensions, whatever they are, whether they're skinny or big or anything in between, whether you're tiny or small. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that I always loved about the Ramones look, which to me is maybe the most iconic look, is that... Um, um, my beloved friend Joey Ramon, um, hi. Um, he, you know, he was uh, a foot and a half taller than me, and we used to often talk about how hard it was to find clothing that fit, and uh, for different reasons. And but he just embraced his height, you know. And I feel like that in that era, which was Debbie's era, of course, of course yeah. gave. Um, uh, sort of said, it's okay to look like the way you want to look. Don't feel that you have to wear some fancy costume. Don't feel like you're too tall or too small or too, you know, em embrace who you are. That was the inclusionary thing of punk. And it makes me think of dear Ian Dury, who was mm. in a way emblematic of how punk embraced all sorts of people, except for sweet Jean Vincent. I don't, I've never really heard of another rock artist, you know, with physical, meat, what do you meat, call it now? Meatloaf. Because, you know, he, he'd had polio, you know, he'd had polio. Yes. So his mobility was slightly restricted, and that was unusual, wasn't it, in a pop star? Yeah. Well, or Joe Welch. Who? Yes. yes. Who? Joe Welch. Oh. Joe Walsh, the guitarist. Well, guitar yes, but was he physically you know, something? Well, he had a he had a stammer. Yes, yeah. that's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. Are there any rock artists that you guys look to at the moment and you feel that they are um, visually iconic, future iconographs that make a really good style statement? That's a really good question. I'm going to have to go away and think about it. Okay. Well, <laughs> on, on Thursday night, I went, uh, Solange has a, a series. She's doing at BAM now, and she had a mm -hmm. singer named Solange. Oh, Solange. Right. She curated a series at BAM, and they, she had uh, Khalili perform, uh -huh. yep. who came out in this outfit, which, you know, Cher often talked about she and Bob Mackie would work on an outfit and they would cut out pieces, mm. you know, with it. and I thought Khalili went in with a big scissor. And, <laughs> and it was, oh it God. was like below her uh, hip and it was like up to here, you know, Amazing. but it was, it was, uh, I was surprised when she came out, mm, but yeah. it was great. Very it cool. Was really great. Very I guess cool. being a little bit risque is not, is, is a good thing in rock style. I, I, you know, it, you know, when you work in music, it's like movies, and you know, part part of part of you, what your what your job is is to uh, be entertaining and appealing. Yeah, so yeah. You, I don't think you can drop some of your assets. You know, and <laughs> say, I, I'm only here about playing the music. Okay, well. <laughs> But today we're talking about style. Well, exactly. But rock is supposed to be which music that your parents hate. So there should yeah. be some, you know, Doesn't work clothing they hate. So I think what Vivian's about to say is that we have time for questions if anybody has. You know, there's a doyen of rock style sitting right here 
a woman who absolutely changed the look of rock star for the world in perpetuity. Maybe you want to introduce her, Tish and Snooki, oh, to yes. start up. Please. Yes, she, she, yes, we're very lucky to have her here. It was such an honor to meet her. Indeed. And I do mention her in Revenge of the Sheepunks. And, uh, you know, her, I don't know how you did it in a lab or what, it's a good story. Um, I think that Vivian's already pitched two stories to me and the panel's not even done yet. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so her uh, finding a way to bring hair color not at all restricted by boring old nature uh, and, and making it accessible to the people in retail. I can't thank you enough. Okay, we have like 10 more minutes left. If there's questions, it seems like Jane Green has a question. Hundred percent. Hey, and excuse me, Jane. With. And who she was hanging out with? Thank you. Anita was the one who created the look for the Rolling Stones in the late 60s. Right. So the context of that, and England, as you will remember, Vivian, was recovering from the war, from the grey 50s, from rations, and suddenly we had the youth culture. We burst into colour. So everyone was going to Granny Takes a Trip and Hung on You and Kensington Bieber, Market, right? Ken Market. Um, but, and, I, and my question is, what was the context for Debbie Harry? What was the context of, of, of Debbie Harry in New York? Where did the influences come from? What was going on in New York in the area then? Oh. New York was uh, the cover of the New York Post. Uh, President Ford says to New York, drop dead. The er that era in New York was so much desolation because the city was bankrupt. And there would be, uh, Bushwick would get set on fire and there was incredible unemployment. What, what you see today with homelessness, it was like that times 10. And part of the reason that the hip hop movement um, st the rap movement began in that era was that um, the, the graffiti art was because the subways were incredibly dangerous and people were looking for creative outlets. And as, as Vivian said so rightly, the climate in England now feels a little bit like that fuel for something interesting to happen because, um, well, in, in France, they're not picking up the garbage. There's garbage strikes. Yeah, and in England, there's all this stuff. So I think, and part of it is from firsthand memory of that era in New York, um, there was so much not to look forward to in New York that creative people found ways to manifest that energy into something positive. And the other thing that's very big about that era in New York is, again, I say this having lived it, is um, that uh, in that era, if you were creative, you hung out in the same place as everyone else creative. So it didn't matter so much if you were a dancer, singer, writer, um, painter, you all hung out in the same clubs and the clubs were it. Um, so there was this kind of, again, like fuel, you agree, yes? Yeah. Yeah, um, this fuel of, um, creative back and forth of your friend Jean-Michel Basquiat saying, come over, I'm a dancer, but come over and take a look. And there being jazz music in the background and Fab Five Freddy coming to hang out. And I don't mean to glorify it, but it was very unified in a way that just doesn't exist anymore. I think there's yeah. two words that underline everything you've just been saying, and they are cheap rent. Yeah. Cheap rent and squats. That is what helps make a subculture that will resonate and grow to be a dominant global culture. And that's why, I mean, 
I don't know whether it's going to be the same quite now to put things together in New York, because you have to really earn quite a lot of money to really get by in New York. And sometimes when you're starting out and you're putting things together from a little bit of this and a little bit of that in your imagination, you ain't got it like that, Dosh-wise. Mm. Am I right? So anyway, that's just something to bear in mind. That is part of the heady mix that produced punk and punk style was accessibility. We could all afford to hang out together. And the people live nearby. You know, they could actually like, which is not the Such way it is. Such a community, so. like it was in London, in London at the exactly. punky reggae party when Aswad and the Clash, they lived, they were neighbors on Lancaster Road, you know. Exactly, exactly. And, yeah. and that's when the music was starting. But mm -hmm. even if you think about the 50s or 60s and you think about the Soho district in New York, mm -hmm. I mean, artists were, were living in those spaces, in those buildings for sometimes no money, sometimes True. money, uh, but they were large spaces that they could create in. And it evolved, you know, and then it became a music scene, it became a dance scene. Uh, you know, and an art scene more. too. And an art scene, yeah. continued to be an art yeah. scene. Yeah, I think we have another question, am I right? Yes, I've been summoned to the microphone Excellent. all the way yonder. Not my, not my um, choice. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. This is really, it's really exciting to have a panel of experts here with us in Westport. Um, you're talking about community, being in person, and how that makes for the ability to create and to perpetuate a counterculture like punk. What do you think social media is doing to our ability as a generation and to future generations for their ability to create a, a movement that can sort of, you know, take, take hold in the way that anything like punk has. I think it's really sad. I don't mean to sound like a Debbie Downer, but um, my, my first book written many, many moons ago is about the intersection of music and fashion. It's called Manic Pop Thrill. And I was very interested in that, uh, influenced in that book um, by a book called Subculture, The Meaning of Style by a British theoretician, Dick Hebdige. And that book, my book, was a later era of fashion than he talks about in his book, but it was basically about how before the internet, you would wear the clothing that represented the kind of music you liked. So if you were a mod or a punk or you liked this band versus that band, you dressed in a different way. And because of the way people engage in music today more through downloads and you know um, maybe posting a picture on the internet as opposed to thinking about uh, wow what am I going to wear to the gig you know um, culturally it's really different and I think that type of um, uh, semiotic expression of I'm going to wear this because it sends the signal that I like these 12 things are, is not so much the case anymore you guys agree I, I, sorry yeah, come on. I have a lot of nieces and nephews, and they're all like in their teens and 20s. So I personally would love, I, I, I watch them, you know, and, and what they're doing with like social media or on social media. And I, they actually give me a lot of faith, I have to say. Like, because they're making, you know, one's a cheerleader, but she's also just like this really edgy kid, you know, and she's not, you know, just this cheerleader, you know. And so it's like kind of interesting because she's, she has a different dynamic about her where, you know, when you were a cheerleader, you were sort of like, you know, this kind of square, you know, and, and with her, she's not like that at all. She's sort of like an intersection of things. So it's like, um, I, and I think maybe that's partly to do with the internet and the fact that, you know, she's, you know, she has a girlfriend, you know, and, and she's not worried about having a girlfriend, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, something like that is, is special. And I think like, you know, I have a nephew who, who is a designer, and some of the stuff he comes up with is insane. Like, you know, and so, and I, but I think, you know, part of it's coming from like anime and things like that, but, but I do think that they're, they are creating something. This is, this, it's my hope that they are, because I think that they're, those, just those two kids and, you know, another niece of mine, they're so special in the way that they, that they put things together and ideas together and create that, I have to say, I have I have faith in, in them, and I think they actually will do something that's really amazing, you know. And it's probably just because I love them, but <laughs> you know, Maybe. but I but I but I really do. I, I do have a lot of faith in that. So, but fashiony people and and 
um, musicians and so on. I'm new. I mean, I'm not that accomplished in cyberspace, although I, you know, I get by. But I've noticed that people really do find each other. They find stylists and designers. They find them on Instagram, and they gosh, they go, gosh, I like your stuff. Will you contact me? So I suppose, in a way, that is the equivalent of Lancaster Road in Ladbroke Grove or Houston Street or Stanton Street. I suppose that maybe it is a new highway where people find each other and hang out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think it is, but I also do think that there's a lot to be said, because, you know, there's, like, kids will write me and they'll say, how do you, yeah. you know, how did you come up with this, or, you know, and I do tell them, you know, you, ha you do have to create a community, you have to be around people, you know, you, that's part of, like, what the whole thing is, is that, you know, you have to have friends who are, who are doing things, you know, because it's like, if Karen wouldn't have come to me, I might have never been a designer, you know, and then it's like, you know, it is that thing where it's like everyone joins together. Somebody's a painter, someone's a, you know, a, a singer, someone's a dancer, you know, and so it is that you do have to have that community. But I think, like, you can also find find it. I mean, you have to search it out, I think, in the ways that you did kind of have to search it out before. But I don't know. I, I just have hope. <laughs> oh, it's true. Do we have another question? Yeah. Um, as you've been sharing all this great information, I find myself thinking about people like Bruce Springsteen or Rob Thomas who basically perform in t-shirt and jeans. And I can't readily think of females who do that. And I'm wondering if you think that just because of being female and being in the rock genre, uh, women don't have that option to dress down, that they feel they, do, they have to be they? more. I don't know, that's a good question. Don't a lot of artists perform in jeans, girl artists, women artists? I think for, with indie rock they did. Americana, yeah, yeah, in like Americana was, they do. I think loads of them do. But remember, there's record companies, if you go the major label route, you said indie, you're right. If you go the major label route, there's a lot of voices and a lot of money involved. And the chance of someone not saying something crazy sexist is slim you know, including, oh, she's pretty, we might as well, you know, so, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but I thought they did. Yeah. It, it, do you have a question? Um, hi. Uh, so uh, the previous question, how she was, you guys were kind of talking about how, like, uh, with music, you feel that social media has kind of like ruined it in a sense because yeah. people aren't able to purchase CDs or um, there's not such a big community or people aren't excited like, oh, I want to wear this because I love this group or um, for concerts, they don't know what they're going to wear. Like, and now it's just kind of like, oh, whatever. Um, personally, I think there are some still some music genres that have that like in within it. Um, I personally really love... Uh, the Korean pop, otherwise known as K-pop. It's K -pop, becoming a cool. bigger thing, right. obviously, in the United that. States. And a lot of people, like, I've met so many people because it's such, it's such a huge community. And actually, CDs are a huge part still of that culture. Uh, you'll find that even at, like, Target or Walmart, the huge industry with that, uh, a lot of people love dressing depending on what group they like. Um, they wear whatever, or like for concerts even, there's so many people who just are so passionate about that music. So I know sometimes it seems like with rock or pop, those like special elements that have always been in music are kind of been lost because of the internet and then obviously the new age. But in reality, there's so many other areas you can really find that. That's yeah, no, so absolutely. awesome. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. so encouraging, yay. Yeah, yeah but it's just, we were just yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think that's right on, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when you, th when you look at a band like Blackpink, I mean, every one of them has a contract with a different couture house. God. I mean, <laughs> and there's five of them. I mean, it's extraordinary, oh, you know? Right. So, right. I mean, they're definitely thinking style. Yeah, sure. exactly, exactly. Sort of yeah, and another thing I wanted to say, I'm sorry I'm saying so much. Awesome, um, keep going. <laughs> uh, I personally, uh, there's so many groups that I enjoy. Uh, like, I really like this group called Stray Kids, and there's another group called G Idol, and I feel like, and a lot of, like, like modern pop now, a lot of them don't produce their own music or they don't write the lyrics or they don't make the concepts for the album or they don't they don't really do music videos anymore. But with this music, uh, especially these groups, they, they write all their music, they produce all their music. They, you can really find their soul within the songs and the lyrics because they're really trying to use music as how it's always really been, a, a way to kind of express your emotions and, you know, like show the world who you are. So... Yeah, I, there's so many groups like that that I feel deserve more recognition because of the things that they're doing. And so, I don't know. That, that's just something I wanted to share. That's amazing. Well, 
And look, I mean, these, the women we're talking about today, it's all about expressing who they are. That's really the light motif here, that there's different ways to express who you are. Being able to express, being able to express yourself uniquely, post-feminist, post-punk gift to women. Exactly, and we're talking about, I mean, Lizzo obviously is still performing, as are the other two women, you know, and they're still alive and well, but, um, but we're talking about some fashions that are decades old and they're just as impactful today. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Do we have any more questions out there in the audience? Would you like to come? Yeah. You made me think of my apartment on 6th Street. Oh, yes. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. No, I'll repeat it so that people can hear the question about Lady Gaga's performance at the Oscars and her stripped down look, and will we get back to that? And that women have to, yeah. I mean, I think that with that, though, that's so well, that's so thought out. You know what I'm saying? So they didn't, she's not just like, you know, oh, I just want to, you know, it's like there's a stylist that was like, we're gonna put you in jeans and a t-shirt because it's gonna be, you know, they want her to look, you know, that certain way. And I, I personally don't think it's ever gonna go back to that. Because I think like part of what's amazing, I mean, you know, it's like looking at performers throughout the decades, you know, like someone like uh, Little Richard say, yeah. you know, it's oh. like their outfits, I mean, you know, you remember that outfit, you remember that, that like, you know, the way he performed and all of that stuff and I think like, I mean, I know when I first started out with Yaya's, yeah, yeah, like um, people were just wearing t-shirt and jeans. And I was part of kind of an indie rock scene in Chicago. And it was like very looked down upon for you to actually dress up and like, and like try to like look like something because it was like, you weren't really thinking of the music. You were just thinking about this being this performer. And it was sort of looked down upon that you would be this woman who would want to get dressed up and, sh and show herself, you know, in this way, too. So I think it's, I think it probably kind of goes up and down. But I think, you know, with, with indie rock, it was all about, you know, you wore a T-shirt and jeans. You know, you kind of, like, pretended like you weren't there, you know. And then it's like, you know, suddenly you have these bands who are like, no, we're here. We're, and, and especially, you know, with, like, women, it's like, you're like, no, no, we're here. This is who we are. I'm going to wear this outfit and you can eat it, you know? And it's like, and I, and I, so I think it's like, you know, it's really special for people to wear things on stage. And if you're expressing yourself through just wearing jeans and a t-shirt, that's a great thing too. But it's like, but I think, you know, it's so, you know, she, I'm sure that was like super well thought out and it's cool. You know, it's always looks cool. And it's like nice to see her actually in something that's not crazy too, you know? So. Maybe you, you know, but don't they sexualize men as well in the music industry and their clothes? Well, I don't know. The thing that you said earlier, which freaked me out, and I, I know you're right, is that the photographers were shooting up Karen O's dress. Oh, yeah, it I was like such a thing. Do that like to me on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, they're. Well, because they're kind of looking at you as like, oh, look at this crazy woman. You know, she's like, so she must not care if I, you know, shoot up her dress. And you're like, of course I care, you know, it's like, that's like sexual abuse, you know, in, in a lot of ways, you know, so. Right. Do they sexualize men in their, when they dress Bowie. them for, for, for Bowie. Yeah. Uh, Bowie. Bowie, Mick Bowie, Jagger. Bowie, yeah, Mick that's Jagger. true. Yeah. But I, Bowie I, I, dressed I, I, himself. Mick, yeah. Bowie knew what to wear at all times. But just, if, if you're doing your K-pop band or somebody like that, and, oh, she's the one to ask. And if you're dressing a guy, don't you try and make him sexy too in his clothes? I've only really dressed one guy. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, you know, I know when I think of like rock fashion or, you know, how it like, you know, working with, with women, like I always draw from like men's style personally, like, like Brian Ferry, you know, people like that. Cause I just think there's like the kind of this like oozing coolness about it, you know, that's like, mm. you know, and I mean. Um, but 
but let's think about somebody like um, mm. Lil Nas X. Yeah. Oh, he looks amazing. You know, he looks he's, amazing. he's yeah. definitely going for the sex. Yeah, yeah. He you looks know, amazing. Not being shy. Yeah. No, not know. at all. Yeah. Yeah. I so. think they try and sexualize him, but maybe it just does Rod Stewart as well. back in the day. Rod oh yeah. Stewart. Oh my yeah. God, he looked Stewart. amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean, the guys always had to wear like spandex pants. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. And yes. especially in the you know in the seventies. But think about people like Barry White. Uh, you know. I yeah. mean, he, he, you know, he was a Big. Rizzo size, yeah. you know, but, but he, because of his voice and the songs he was singing, it was very sexy, you know. Can I say a word for, I think, one of the coolest dressed men in music ever? Please. That would be Fela Anikulapo Kuti from Nigeria. He is my style icon. Like, I've got to be honest, you know, I, I, I like to wear clothes that look like the clothes he wore you when I came. Great. Which is a great moment for me to advertise the show we have in coming up in Brooklyn <laughs> on, on, a, on African fashion, oh, amazing. which will have some outfits by Fila. Ah! Oh. And you know, you know his, he, he had everything made, he had his own tailors, and I trust you're featuring his shoes. Good. Wow. wow. Yes. Okay, well, that was like you heard it here first. So, uh, so I have to talk. I, all right, so I believe our time is up. I'm right, yes? We have time for one more question. Is there anybody that's got a question? Otherwise, we can say thank you to our wonderful panelists. And Is there anything else the panelists else? feel we didn't cover that we should be saying? Uh, OK. OK. Well, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> He's got a question. Oh. I only ever saw Bella in a ski show. <laughs> oh, lucky you. <laughs> ba boom. <laughs> Well, he, he had this lean line, and you know, he had the fitted shirts, and then the sort of slacks, but they were heavily embroidered, and so were the shoes, and he worked with local artisans, which is an extension of what we were saying about once a mod, always a mod, and everybody should have their own tailor, if at all possible, in the old school way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When is that show, by the way? Uh, June. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you guys all for coming. Thank my wonderful panelists. I hope you all listen to thank the music you. very loudly this afternoon. Thank you again. All right, give it up for our panel. Just to let you know, there's so much more with VersaFest. Uh, in the back here, we've got the Wall of Sound from 1974. There is an auction going on with records signed by Steve Lillywhite, the, the albums that he uh, produced. Steve, um, we also have Talking Heads album signed by Chris Franz, who just got up and talked about a man in his uh, Speedo, and uh, his, his wonderful wife, uh, Tina Weymouth. Upstairs, there is a museum of Dr. Dre's snakes, Dr. Dreary's snakes, uh, museum of Alice Cooper memorabilia. Really cool things. Tomorrow, Later on today, we have a panel on uh, photography and rock and roll, and tomorrow we have a, um, in the hub, there's going to be a record swap, a panel on vinyl, and we're also going to have 50 years of hip-hop in Connecticut, as well as tomorrow night, a documentary live from the AstroTurf dealing with, uh, again, uh, Alice Cooper. So come on out, VersaFest is not over. Stay and enjoy yourselves. Thank you for coming.